he indicated that, and I know this for a time, a lot of unusual <coughs> age mm -hmm. types of situations like mm -hmm. the departments do, mm -hmm. but they do the same thing. There's a lot of things that interest me. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. great. All right, welcome back, everybody. We are continuing testimony on page 610. And, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. So I'll, pick, I'll start going through the bill. Great. Fashion. So the first place I come to is on page four. It's talking about the transfers uh, with the license the dealer. We really have no uh, position on that. I have no comments to offer on that. So the beginning of section two talks about request for relief. Um, and the language added. Um, this it starts out. This section is actually the, the if you will, the final right. hearing. Right. Um, and so. I mean, we don't, I guess, qualifying my earlier testimony. I mean, I think it's, it's certainly in, in, in any case involving uh, domestic violence of, of the type that the, the committee has heard, it's certainly appropriate uh, that there be um, a, a restriction on firearms in a very long fashion. Um, so we don't have any objection to that. Um, and at the final hearing, contrary to the emergency hearings, we're no doubt going to have more evidence um, that would warrant um, the imposition of that, that type of, rest those restrictions. Um, the subdivision four is the one I talked about earlier this morning. That's on the bottom of page seven. At the final hearing, if the defendant testifies under oath, the defendant may never get to testify for the reasons I stated earlier this morning. Um, if there is already an order, a temporary order, of not possession, uh, prohibiting possession of firearms, it's unlikely that we would get testimony from the defendant at that time. I mean, they're certainly free to, to speak, but we would have to give them that. Warning, admonition. Any questions on that concern? Can I ask, a, sure. in general, how often do you, or, or, is there any other place that you can think of that you're put in that position? Of the shelf? No, of, of, of sort of having to ask a question but let people know that, but in, you're, you're talking about how you um, are in a situation where the person's being asked a question, which you then have to advise them. Well, usually the way it comes about, or certainly when I'm presiding over these courts, um, knowing what may be coming, the admonition is given uh, right up front, mm -hmm. and, and making them aware that they don't have to uh, testify, or if they do testify, anything they say can be used against them. Right, but here we have a situation where they're going to be asked a question directly. The way the bill's written now, they would be asked a question about their possession of firearms. And that's why I'm saying before that question was ever asked, I would provide them with that warning. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's up to them whether they waive the right and they, they want to testify. But it sounds like an awkward situation in the, to create for the courts to do. Is it typical? Well, it's typical, in, in at least in my experience in RFA proceedings, that I always uh, provide the defendant with that warning. Mm -hmm. Because I may not, I have an affidavit in front of me. Um, if, if, if I've heard from the plaintiff, and it's the defendant's opportunity to testify, um, I will advise them then, that even though this is a civil proceeding, that the nature of the testimony that came out um, may in fact involve uh, an allegation of a crime 
I mean, that the person does not have to testify at that point. So it, at least in my experience, it's quite common in any of these proceedings, even without these provisions in there, in that the, I will give that warning because of the nature of the proceeding and the nature usually of the facts that, that bring us there. Mm -hmm. So it is, at least for me, it's pretty it's standard. Pretty and I would think it would be standard for any judge because of the circumstances. In fact, there are some judges that take the view that if a charge is pending and the person is not able to testify because of the inability to testify because of a pending criminal case, they will continue the case until that uh, restriction is lifted. But that's not a policy that I ever pursued mm -hmm. and recommend against it. Thank you. Coach and Ken. Your Honor, how are you? Good. Um, one of the things that came up uh, in earlier testimony uh, was in reference to the, uh, the temporary restraining orders uh, and the fact that uh, New Hampshire, for example, uh, has a provision once served always listed with no expiration? I've heard of it, but I haven't read it or looked at it. But and, and as you can uh, imagine, uh, the reason that came up in the discussion, you know, was the possibility of maybe us, Vermont, looking into doing that similarly uh, in order to protect uh, the family member that's under duress. Uh, do you have any just general thoughts about that possibility? You know, without, I wouldn't comment on the mm -hmm. New Hampshire language without mm -hmm. looking at it, but I understand the concept mm -hmm. and it's been discussed. And mm -hmm. I, I would say, without looking into it in detail, I, I don't have a, an objection right now, but I, I think the wording is important. Right. Um, New Hampshire has some other uh, parts of the statute that we should emulate as well. Thank you. Will you let us know which parts those are? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get to that hopefully in the next few minutes when we talk Excellent. about a, uh, a warrant. But, uh, excuse me. Um, Is it generally followed that that uh, the other judges will follow your way and not? No, that's why I was saying earlier. There are 30 independently appointed, retained judges that make their own decisions. I can uh, recommend, <laughs> I can encourage, I always let them know when, for instance, a bill like this um, um, comes out, I will circulate it, ask them for their comments. I mean, when I'm testifying here, I'm not just testifying personally, but some of the uh, responses I got from judges are reflected in the testimony that, that, that I'm providing here. Um, but no, I don't have that authority. I can, as I said, I can recommend and I can encourage Educate. I can try, uh, but uh, ultimately they have to make their own decisions, and um, and I I don't have the ability to. Uh, I can question, but I I can't uh, overturn or tell them how to rule on anything, and that's what I was getting at earlier with how they handle this particular issue of firearms. Uh, I think varies from judge to judge, but I, I don't think you will find um, any judge that doesn't recognize the significance of firearms as it relates to these cases. Okay. Um, and you, at the very end of the testimony, the last piece is the conditions of release uh, provision that talks about um, no purchase or uh, possessing firearms as a condition of release in a criminal case. Um, that is so ingrained in the system mm -hmm. that it, it, is a, it is on our standard conditions of release form. Whether it's in the statute or not, it's there, and it's a box that's checked. And at least in my experience, anytime there's a domestic violence case um, before the court, um, conditions of release, that's a box that's checked without without thinking. About it. E even if even if at that point firearms are not necessarily an issue in that particular incident that brings a person there, because of the nature of the offense and the issues surrounding firearms and domestic violence 
it's almost, it's almost a matter of routine. Thank you, sir. So uh, the next section that I have uh, begins, uh, the court may issue a warrant. Now again, this is at, the way that the bill is framed, this is at the uh, final hearing. And there is a great deal of difference between what happens at a final hearing versus the, the temporary restraining order or the, or the emergency order. Uh, The decision, the Hemingway decision that uh, David was referring to, and I think um, I know a legislative council has access to it, um, it a, a reading of that decision, you will see that the issuance of a search warrant in that case was done uh, by a judge in a court hearing. There was a record, uh, in other words, it was during court hours. Um, it was not a, a nighttime uh, request. And that difference, the distinction between the nighttime and the court hours is very significant for a lot of reasons. So I, I would agree, at least from my reading of the Hemingway case, that uh, this, this bill, um, beginning on page seven, the top of it, accurately reflects the language in Hemingway. Um, and I, I don't have, um, we don't have any, any objection to it in terms of what's required. I think the fact that it's done as part of the final hearing um, has more merit than the emergency order, and I, I will explain why. Um, but at a final hearing, there's an opportunity for the court to explore um, the information it needs in order to grant this warrant. Uh, and by that I mean uh, the court is free at that time um, to ask the questions that we were talking about this morning, that there may be some reluctance to do so unless there's a reason to do it. And this would, if, if the person before the court is requesting a warrant, then there is a reason to inquire um, about these areas and particularly what are the firearms, what kind of firearms, or whatever, whatever information the, the plaintiff, um, and again, we would be in the first instance relying on the plaintiff to provide this information. What firearms um, and where are they located? A search warrant, whether it's civil or criminal, uh, the significance is um, the particularity of the items to be searched for and where they could be located within the property of the, of the defendant, either home or car. Um, but that's, that, the final hearing gives us that opportunity to ask those questions. Um, contrary to the emergency order, where we're relying strictly, if, if one is granted, on an affidavit filed by the plaintiff, there's no opportunity uh, for exchange. So doesn't that just mean that that <coughs> temporary or the emergency um, order situation that you'd just be less inclined to find probable cause. I mean, if you're not able to ask those questions because you just have an affidavit, either the affidavit was sufficient or wasn't. I mean, certainly if it's in, a, in the court, you're able to ask for the questions to, to determine, you know, if there really is more there to lead to probable cause. But again, at that wouldn't you just judge it on what's on the, on the uh, in the affidavit? It's either you mean on the, in the, the, in the temporary. Uh, well, you would, but there. Are, a search warrant is a is a is one of the most significant actions that we take, for the reasons stated by. David Shear and others, when you're talking about um, issuing an order to retain or search someone's home, uh, retain property. And, and I think the importance of that, um, if it's going to mean anything, um, I think uh, Chief Burke reflected on the importance of the search warrant. Um, and I, 
the, the odd, one of the odd things is that by putting it into a final order and giving the court the ability to question someone about the need for a warrant and the circumstances is something we don't even get with a criminal warrant. Because when a criminal warrant is presented to us, and you heard from Pepper, and I believe the police officer, but certainly from Pepper, when I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning for a search warrant from the police officer, the first thing I ask, or any judge will ask, is has it been reviewed by a state's attorney? Um, that's to develop, um, that's to make sure, first of all, that it has been reviewed by the state's attorney, and they're satisfied that it meets, at least in their mind, the criteria um, for granting the warrant. But when I review the warrant, I may have questions um, but I don't ask the police officer. There, there's no record. And so I, I accept that affidavit and that request on face value. Um, it is not an opportunity for me to question the officer and say, hey, this is missing. You need to go back to the state's attorney or you need to go back to this witness and get more information. And so in some respects, this civil warrant, the way it's laid out, uh, provides that opportunity uh, in, a, in a civil context in a final hearing. Uh, that will be lost, uh, certainly, in, in the uh, overnight hearing, the emergency hearing. Um, but the, 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 the procedures for obtaining a criminal warrant, um, I'll refer the committee to Rule 41 of the Criminal Rules of Procedure, are quite extensive. There are limitations, for example, uh, on, even on a criminal warrant, on the hours in which a property can be searched, the, the length of time that a warrant is outstanding, uh, what's required uh, on a return on the warrant, uh, disclosure of what was uncovered. I mean, there, there are a number of procedural rules and safeguards. Uh, for instance, the, when I say the hours, we're not allowed to grant a, a search warrant other than between the hours of 6 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night, unless there is a, an exception there, there's a factual exception. Something is going to disappear if we don't grant that warrant right away. So there are, there are restrictions on our ability to do that. Um, there are other restrictions. That don't, it's only in existence for, for 10 days, uh, for example. Um, now, if we don't serve the individual, in this case, you grant an emergency order, and they're not served, that warrant is no good. Uh, they'll have to come back to court uh, to extend that. So what, what one of the concerns I have is that there is no process, there is no procedure laid out for this warrant and what happens to it, how it's processed. And I'm talking about, I, I guess I'll continue to talk about the emergency warrant. I mean, the emergency warrant, you have to understand, um, contrary to a criminal search warrant, you are getting, you are, the individual, the plaintiff is contacting um, either a staff person or a contract person, someone we've contracted with for an after-hours process, who have no training in this. They are not an advocate for the, the person applying. Uh, they are at best a scrivener. Um, I'll get into more detail about that. Um, but they're not there to tell the person what they need in the affidavit or to, to say that's not enough. We need to have more. There is no uh, role for them in that regard. So, though that still seems that the end result is you don't find probable cause and don't issue the warrant. I mean, it's, it's the the burden should remain the same, shouldn't it? I mean, yeah, there's procedural safeguards. And it would be great if we could have a procedure where somebody knows exactly how to help this individual who's seeking help on a late Friday night. You know, that it can help them put that together, but she or he either puts that together or not. Is, I mean. I can't disagree with that, but I, I, I guess my concern would be if, you're, if the committee is, is serious about the merit in, in justifying a, a warrant, I would think you would want to go through the, and adopt procedures 
to make this effective. But let me go back for a minute. So, so yeah, I agree with that as well. I'm just trying to parse out. But that, let me that. tell you what the real problem is. And, and it's with, quite frankly, the after hours relief from abuse process as it's evolved. Uh, when that process started, and I forget how many years ago it was, um, almost every, um, uh, in almost every county, or at least accessible, were state police. Uh, the sheriff's offices often were 24 hours a day. There was accessibility to police um, for these after-hour calls. And so the staff, um, these are volunteer uh, positions, and staff followed. And about three years ago, um, we started getting calls from certain areas where um, the, the landscape had changed. The police the departments were not open 24 hours. And we had staff uh, members meeting with uh, um, victims in the parking lots of, of empty police stations. Um, and so we started to look into this situation and without spending a lot of time on what's happened, I can tell you that within the last six months, we've, we've had this significant upheaval in the ability to, to maintain after hours process. And by that I mean, at this point, uh, the numbers I have are there are nine counties that are relying on contractors. In other words, they are not staff people. Uh, we have had to hire people. They are doing that. M most of them are covering multiple counties, so it's all done by telephone. Um, there are still, looks like, um, four counties that have some staff that are still willing uh, to go out after hours. The, the caveat to that is that, and the, the Supreme Court has taken the position that if people are still going out, they can only go out if there is a secure setting for them to do that. And quite frankly, there are fewer and fewer safe settings. A safe setting um, is a police presence throughout the process for, for processing this, this uh, request for a relief from abuse order. Um, and that doesn't mean a dispatcher. Uh, the dispatchers oftentimes are behind uh, a safety glass or in a, a room that no one else has access to. Um, and so the court has basically said there's got to be a safe setting. We're, by, what you're really doing is adding another obligation onto a system um, that, in, that in my view is broken. Uh, David Shear said that the, the New Jersey case that in part provides a basis for this. It's constitutionally sound. It, you've, you've adopted the language in it, and he said it's similar to our procedure. It's similar to our procedure in all but one respect. If you want an, an after-hours order in New Jersey, you go to law enforcement. <coughs> We're the only state that I'm aware of that attempts to process these after-hours requests through staff or hired staff. And New Hampshire, uh, I mentioned, I would get to New Hampshire. New Hampshire has, if you want an after hours order, you go to law enforcement. Massachusetts, you go to law enforcement. The New Jersey process, that's why I said reading that decision, you <coughs> see that that was an in court uh, during courtroom hours. But the idea uh, that we would take essentially a, a non-legal trained person and add the element of a search warrant and the importance of a search warrant. And to me, just uh, it's adding a burden on a system that is not working now. Not working in the sense that it's more and more difficult to be able to staff those positions And are we putting people at risk in sending them out, even the few where staff are still able to go out? Are we putting staff and victims <coughs> at further risk by sending them out in the middle of the night for a warrant or for a relief from abuse order? And so my concern is that 
we have a system that is struggling after our loss process. We're the only one that is doing it that way. Um, and so if the, if the warrant is important, and I think it could be, then it ought to be done in an appropriate manner and not just say we don't have the procedures, we don't have the rules, so let's do it and if you if you don't grant it, so be it. <coughs> if you want a warrant, apply for it as part of the final hearing. So that we can that there can be a full exploration of, of the investigation, if you will, that, that uh, Chief Burke talked about, at least by the court. And that's what you'll see in the Hemingway decision. That's what the, the judge was relying on. Um, so I, I'm concerned about adding another burden onto people who aren't trained for this. And that's why I'm saying if you look at the procedure involved for a criminal warrant, um, and I'm sure Representative Hashim has been through, I mean, to do it properly and to make sure that it's done properly. Pepper testified it might take hours to process. Thank you. But the important thing is that you have a trained individual, a police officer, uh, who knows what is necessary um, to obtain a warrant and presents that to a state's attorney who will then review it and say, yes, I think this is enough, or go back and get more. And I don't know why we want to overlook that process for a civil warrant. So I, get, I, mean, I don't think we're overlooking the process. I mean, there's, um, I, I guess first of all, just looking at what a person would have to show in sufficient particularity. I mean, we're not talking about looking for contraband or any number of things. We're looking for the firearms that the individual who has just shown probable cause or shown enough to get an RFA that abuse has occurred and is likely to continue, uh, that there are firearms identified and the location is identified. I, what more is the law enforcement looking for for probable <coughs> cause? Well, there's one more element, uh, I didn't list all of them, that, that the it's search is necessary to protect the life, health, or well-being of the victim. I mean, if an individual can show that, I don't, I don't, I'm still not understanding what more law enforcement would be adding. I do understand the safety component, that's a different, that's, that's the execution of the warrant as opposed to whether it should issue. And yeah, perhaps there could be training for individuals for, <coughs> yeah, I do understand, I'm sorry, I'm kind of going on, there's a quite, I'll, I'll try to form a question out of all right. this, uh, Judge, but, um, so, but I guess taking a higher level look is, I think saying that we need to just wait for the final for a warrant is really you're missing the, the period of time that we're really mostly focusing on. And, and if there are suggestions of how to make this work better, I'm still not convinced that, that an affidavit that goes over these elements that we've spelled out that have to be there and, and, and we get that from the court. I understand why that's not sufficient, but if there's ways to make it work better that we're not delaying, you know, getting the lethal weapons out of that situation, you know, I, I'm certainly open. I think we'd be open to that, but. Well, I think you have, uh, you have an option that's in place, and that is instead of linking it to an RFA, you link it to an ERPA order, where you do have police officers and you have the state's attorneys. Well, we could do that here, having this, we can do the RFA process and have the state's attorney and law enforcement. That's the other component of this, is the many individuals who don't want to get law enforcement involved, but need to get the protection. And, and I think we're going to get to the other ERPO problem as far as those <coughs> after hours and not, you know, we don't have <coughs> procedure set up even like we have for the RFA. I understand that, but, but that's the issue, is that it, we, we don't want to dissuade individuals from seeking that protection because they don't want to go to law enforcement. I, I understand the issue, um, and I think we have to ask ourselves, I mean, this, this after-hour system that we have is, is unique. 
Um, and I'm not, I think there are alternatives. I think New Hampshire, I think New Jersey, uh, the system seems to be working there uh, in those states. Um, and, and so I, I think the same system could work here. So I just wanted a quick question, and I'm sorry, I'm hogging up some more yeah. time. Um, so if it's during court hours, there's not a problem with an individual pro se coming to the court seeking an RFA and presumably a warrant as well as part of that process. I think that process would work. Okay, but it's the after hours. I just want to. <coughs> I think that's the real the, one of the real issues is the after hours um, request. Okay. I want to go back to the <clears throat> the burden you were talking about in the after hours request. Um, for personnel, um, it sounds like there's a fair amount of, for security purposes, a fair amount of um, uh, pressure that can be put on employees uh, to do that properly and safely. It, it's volunteer. I mean, uh, up until I will say the last year or so, I would say most of the courts were being served um, by staff members. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I can't tell you the reasons why, but I can give you some examples of, of things that have happened. That, um, in Lamoille County, uh, for instance, we had three people, three staff people who had been doing it for years. And all of a sudden, they, earlier this summer, last summer, uh, they just said, no, we're done. And they gave us 30 days notice, so we had to find a contract personnel that would fill that position. We had an incident in Barrie at the beginning of the summer where there were actually two longtime staff members that were doing this after hours work. And they were in the Barrie City Police Station processing a request for, for an RFA. Um, and the defendant was somewhere outside of the building but knew they were there and texting. And I don't know what the nature of the texts were, but I'm sure they weren't pleasant and, right. and, and threatening. Um, to the point where people didn't know where this individual was. Was, in this case, he just outside the building or was he could have been 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. But enough so that the staff members said, we're done. We quit. I mean, we had no notice. They just quit. Okay. Within a couple of weeks, they both came back. <coughs> Within a week or so, a couple of weeks after that, one of them said, no, I'm definitely not. And so there's been this, this we put out uh, notices <coughs> To, to hire people for this type of work. Um, and sometimes there's no response to that. So it's getting harder and harder. There's few, certainly fewer and fewer staff that are doing it, mm -hmm. um, that want to do it. It is voluntary. Um, the court is concerned about the safety of individuals going out, not, not just staff, but the safety, the safety of the Right, especially staff. in the, a situation like this that's particularly volatile. And so um, I, I understand why um, victims sometimes do not want to get police involvement. <coughs> um, but I find that there are other alternatives that I think we may have to look at. Um, by, by talking about police involvement, it doesn't mean that a, a crime will be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. It means they will be the one to process the request for the restraining order. Um, and would that be um, volunteer on the part of the police force as well, or would that no, be no, like that a contract be, or no. something? No, they, they would be part of their uh, policing duty. I'm not sure how it's set up exactly in, in New Hampshire or New Jersey, but I know um, <coughs> in looking at this issue and the, the history behind the Hemingway case, I contacted the New Jersey courts to find out, okay, this the Hemingway decision came about as a result of an in-court uh, time hours. Mm -hmm. I said, do you have an after-hours process? And the answer is yes, uh, but it's done through law enforcement. So an individual who needs an order contacts the police. Uh, the police get the information, and the, the, the police officer obviously is trained in knowing what information they need in order to get the order, uh, mm -hmm. more so than, as I said, the staff member or the person contracted is not there to build the case 
for the individual. They're there to take <coughs> down the information, and, and that's, their, that's their role. They're not an advocate. So then the officer, with that information, contacts the court the same way they do now for search warrants or bail, and the, and the uh, judges are obviously converse with them on those issues, and they explain the rationale for an order, and an order is issued. I'm, <clears throat> I'm concerned in putting undue pressure or burdens on uh, judiciary staff or, or the judiciary overall. Uh, do you think that to do this properly, um, uh, we should be considering an appropriation as part of that? <coughs> I, I'm not here asking for an appropriation. I'm not asking here for more resources. I think we need to look at the fundamental process that we're, uh, that we're doing. Um, and, you know, we're asking civilians, if you will, or non-legally trained people to assist people at a point in time when the, 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 the trauma that they're experiencing is at its highest level. Mm -hmm. And these are not individuals who are trained. Um, yes, they get training to some extent before they're out there, but there's a big difference between uh, law enforcement personnel, professional uh, involvement with these. So adding more resources is not the answer as far as I'm concerned, and certainly I'm not here as part of the judiciary. So well, yeah, I'm not asking you to no, say that uh, you're looking for more, more money. I'm we're not. It, it's not a money issue. If, if you were going to put money into it, it would, I suppose it would be uh, reinforcing the state police so that they're open 24 hours a day so that we have a safe and secure <coughs> setting to send the people that are willing to do this work. But that's, that's, that's where we've seen the change, and I'm not faulting the police. <coughs> they're, it's just the way the process has evolved. The departments that were open 24 hours are no longer open. I just want to ensure that we're not creating a more risky situation for a different group of people in an attempt to create a safe situation for I think you're taking a situation that has been in, in, in effect for any number of years, the RFA after hours process. And I understand the value and the importance. Certainly the time is of the essence, one of the witnesses said, and I agree. But I don't think you can overlook the other testimony that talks about the complication of getting a search warrant and the significance of getting a search warrant. And if it's going to be done, it should be done properly with, with professionals involved so that the person who's asking for it isn't going to feel frustrated that now I've got the order, but I didn't get the warrant. Um, and what do I do at that point? Do I, do I take the chance <coughs> that the order is served knowing that the person has guns, but for whatever reason the paperwork they put together wasn't sufficient? That, that's, it, it's, it's looking beyond what we've had, which I, I will I will say that, you know, I, I think we've been fortunate in, in some respects and in, in, in able to provide that service, but it's not the service that we've had over the years, and it's not a question of resources. Um, it's a question of process, and um, I think having the, and I'll get into it with the, with the purple order, uh, having a family member they can't contact a judge. They can't call a judge in the middle of the night. Period. It just doesn't work that way. We don't talk to the litigants. Uh, it's in the nature of what's referred to as an ex parte conference, and we cannot have those. So <coughs> allowing a family member to seek an herbal order, we've got to come up with a process. Um, and that process, in my view, can't be, and somebody asked Pepper if they thought, it could be done the same way as an RFA. Um, that's just adding another burden on to a system that it, it is, in my view, is, is, is broken. Mm -hmm. Because we, we're then again asking a, a, an untrained person with the issues that an ERPO re request comes with <coughs> to be the, the, the intermediary between that individual and, and the court, and I think it should be professional involved, and that, that, that's my concern. Thank you. Um, Sita? Um, I just wanted to ask, a couple of years ago, we worked with you on setting up the process for remote violence affidavits in, in these situations, and 
um, with an eye towards improving some of the security and safety concerns. And I guess I'm hearing that, but like, has that helped at all? Is part of my question. And then, do you it, do you think it, is it possible that having that remote process has actually contributed to some of the outsourcing of this that's happening? No, I, okay. I mean, I can't speak for staff as to okay. why people that have been doing this or yeah. willing to go out for years have said no more. Uh -huh. um, it may be, as you know, we see in the courts, <clears throat> certainly in the time I've either been practicing or on the bench, the level of civility uh, mm -hmm. in individuals just on in a day to day basis. Um, the, the, the behaviors that we see are certainly um, escalating all the time. So, I, whether that's the reason they're not going out or they're just don't want to be on call. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, but the process that we um, implemented, um, quite frankly, in some places uh, it worked. In other places, there's no cell coverage. There's, there's no ability. There's no internet. There's no cell coverage. So, um, did that work out the way we hoped? No. But what it has allowed us to do, which is what has been the saving grace at this point, is these contract uh, folks. Um, are now covering multiple counties because what we're doing is processing these requests for the most part by telephone. And that individual, in other words, the person who wants an order calls a hotline, depending on where they are in the state, if they're still staffed, the hotline calls the staff <coughs> member or the contract person. Right. And so that person can be in Wyndham County but covering a request for relief from abuse in Memorial County. Um, and so that's all, it's all done telephonically now. So um, other than those three or four counties I mentioned, there is no staff going out and the contract count, uh, folks do not go out. They uh, process these telephonically. So that bill, that piece of legislation helped us do what we're doing now. Um, and it seems like moving to more of that telephonic processing would help the safety issues. <coughs> It's, it's made it possible. Yeah. It, it, it's made it possible for us to continue to, to provide that. Okay. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly not the system that's been in place for a long time. So um, we're maintaining that. But that's why I'm concerned about adding you now the time involved in um, processing the request for the warrant and or an ERCO order. Adding that on is just adding on to the burden that's <coughs> already hit. So just a couple points. Um, I just want to make sure I have all the rationale or re reasons why you're saying that the after hours system right now is broken. And I have that there's, uh, you have untrained uh, people interacting between the victim and the court. You have no cell coverage. Were there other reasons why I believe that it, or not reasons why you believe, I understand that it was broken from what I've heard, but what are the other reasons for, for that? How else is this, how else is the after hours system broken? You know, I have the untrained person component, no cell coverage problem. What other issues have you run into? Well, I think there have been times when we just haven't been able to uh, retain or, or hire people to to, to do that kind of work. Um, so availability, really. Is. I'm sorry? Availability of who yes. people would contact, okay. Yes. Any other issues that have come up? I mean, those are pretty big. I, I understand yeah, that, I, I, but I just, I just <laughs> wanted to get a complete list of this that you can give it. I think that, I'll give it some more thought, but that, those certainly are ones that come. And, and I, in my colloquy before, I didn't get to the point of a question, but now I'll go back and ask a ask question. Is that, so what else would law enforcement, besides, yes, they're more professional and, and these people might be trained more, but when we have in the law that this is what you have to bring forward, you know, with particularity, the type and location of any firearm in the defense <coughs> possession, ownership, or control, I understand that having a professional, having law enforcement, 
could help the individual interpret that? Is that the main, or is there other information that would be coming forward? I think there's a difference in whatever information that person brings forward and someone, instead of taking down that information and saying, let's try this, I'll submit it to the judge and that's the end of it. <coughs> as opposed to someone who understands what's necessary to meet that burden, to make sure that the evidence is there. Um, obviously, I'm not a police officer, but I think there's a significant difference if you were granted a, a restraining order and granted a search warrant, and that is then delivered to the police, um, I, I would think the police would have a concern over not being, not knowing what they're getting into. When they get an order, a court order, that says you have to go to this house and you have to serve this person, which they do now, um, but then enter their property. I think, as I think it was, came in at the tail end of, of Chief Burke's testimony, but that, I believe he said, was the highest point of risk or, or a, a very high point of risk for police. And so I'm saying, if that's the way that they're viewing it, um, then why not let them be involved at the beginning so that they can make that assessment um, and, and provide the person who wants this order, who feels they need this order, is getting the best um, opportunity, the best chance of getting that instead of leaving it up to essentially a scrivener that, that when I, that's all they are supposed to be doing. He has, he, I, I think he has a pistol. Uh, you know, it's... Right, so, so just I'm gonna break that apart a little bit. I mean, the, <coughs> you're adding an element of, uh, <coughs> well, it's a, it's a, the probable cause. I mean, there, these are the elements you need to show for probable cause. I don't think we need to add a, how will the law enforcement safely execute this war? That's kind of what that point was getting to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's very important, but that's not part of the probable cause determination. The other thing no, is No, but they would, I'm saying, they would be helping develop that problem. <coughs> sure, that next step as far as how to execute it. Yeah, no, they could no. help, they could help, but that, all right, that's a separate thing. Right. If we had sufficient individuals trained to answer the phone 24 <coughs> hours a day, it doesn't have to be law enforcement to help a person do this. Right now, we're at the, the big issue is we are having trouble retaining and hiring these people, I'm very important, and, and they're not trained. I mean, if we were able to solve, I'm just saying law enforcement is not like, the, it just happens to be the resource that we have available at this time to be able to help an individual with that affidavit. It also gives us the additional benefit of law enforcement being involved so that throughout this process, <coughs> they can understand what they're getting themselves into and how to safely execute the warrant and such. Is that, I mean, is that not the case? I mean, again, once again, I, I lose my questions in the, as I talk on. Did you hear a question in there, by the way? I'll try to fear it. Well, okay. <laughs> I'll try to answer one that, I'll put it this way, I'll answer the question that, that you want to answer. answer, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think at some level we have, I, I understand why victims don't want to involve the police. I understand that. Um, but if we want to make this system effective, why are we so unique that we can't involve police? Why are we so unique from New Hampshire and Massachusetts and New Jersey? What makes us have to take a different path? What is there about the process that is different here that those other processes wouldn't work and work more effectively. So I will ask the question. <laughs> I mean, that if we had the people trained and, and available, could they handle the, the component of getting the information, interpreting what they need to put in the affidavit to 
help them establish probable cause? I don't know, because it's, it's essentially, when I say I don't know, um, <coughs> we have that available to us through law enforcement. Right. No, I, I understood that part. I just, I'm trying to, yeah, all right. I, 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 I'm just going to ask the same question in a different way and the same answer, so that's fine. But no, I, I, I understand where you are with it. Law enforcement is a preferred, you know, they have the expertise, they have the ability to do this, and, and they also has the extra advantage of getting them involved so that they can safely execute the warrant or help them in that process. No. Uh, but no, there's no, still no. that other hurdle. I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Not only can they do it, but understand once many of these orders are issued, they're sent to a, a central dispatch. They're oftentimes not served till the ship comes on at 8 o'clock in the morning. In, in, in my view, that can create a false sense of security for the individual who has come out in the middle of the night. Met with someone they've they have never met before and, 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 and describing <coughs> sometimes their most, the most intimate parts of their life to this person on the other end of the phone. Um, and they get an order, maybe they get a search <coughs> warrant, maybe they don't. But they have no idea when they hang up that phone when that when that order is going to be served. If you have law enforcement involved at the outset, they then have the order in hand. And they will respond to it because it's in their hand. And so it's not, again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough, I understand why they don't want law enforcement involved. I understand the, 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 the thinking behind that. But I'm saying, I think, if we're looking at adding these elements, um, to me it just increases the, 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 the reasons for having them involved in a process that they have not been involved in before, for all the reasons I'm saying. There's nothing um, – some of the orders that go out literally are not served until the ship comes on in the morning. I don't know what we've accomplished. By that process. <coughs> no, I, I, uh, I, I had a, a, a partial question, um, and it's related to the, to the process. And I understand what you're saying, Your Honor, as far as um, the continuum of service. Um, it makes sense that we would maintain that because the uh, we're losing holding stations, um, you know, around the state because of you know the sheriffs, and, uh, you know, just being able to staff these uh, you know, these these stations and the data that we're hoping will be inputted. One of the recommendations was that uh, <coughs> when the um, order is given, it automatically is done like an e-file, uh, either at the court, or in this case, if we were doing something like an e-ticket, for example, that TRO could go into the system at that point, <coughs> and then be on record and on file, you know, so that if an officer encountered a situation with that particular uh, individual, they have automatic access. Um, you know, it, it's I, I think th this particular one might require a little more uh, discussion, uh, but I, I just in listening to the testimony so far, think that there might be uh, an answer here that we're fairly close to if we. Buried it up. Just a thought. I hope we are. <laughs> I don't know if we are or not. It, it, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here and I'm listening to this. And it 
just sounds like to me, we don't have enough law enforcement full time or with the staff, paperwork, etc., etc., uh, to do the job that we need to better protect our citizens. And I think that leads us into bigger problems with all this domestic violence, whether it has to do with guns or not. It, it seems like you come, into, you, you come into play when it's already, the damage is already done, but there's so much more help <coughs> that should be there before it gets to you. Like manpower, which leads me down to this. We don't. Every everybody knows we don't have 24-hour our um, state police. I have 24-hour, seven day a week, 365 day a year police protection in my hometown of, of Northfield. <clears throat> we don't have it as state police. That's messed up in my mind. <laughs> no, I, it's just. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> That's just kind of a. No, but I think in, not to get off the. <coughs> but um, you can talk to any police department, state police, sheriff's police. They're having difficulty recruiting people onto the force. I'm not saying that's why we don't have 24 hours. No, I understand it, but the domestic violence part of this is... I, I understand, and I, and I guess what I'm really saying is it's with, these are, in my view, very significant proposed changes in, in this process, both for the, the civil warrants, um, which there's certainly merit and value to them, and whether or not family members get involved in their vote, but these are significant changes in... All I'm suggesting is now might be a time to look at the system we have and say, can we do better? Yeah, I agree. And, and, and it may not please everyone, but I think we've, we've got to take a look at what we're doing and are we just heading on where it's not helping? <coughs> Thank you. Let me just let me skip through the, I never got past page seven. Um, <coughs> the bottom of seven, we talked about the, the difficulty in asking the defendant. When you get on to page eight of uh, the paragraph about <coughs> the plaintiff providing that information, I understand that there's some proposed language to change that. And again, I would just uh, <coughs> repeat, I, without that information, um, it can only come from the plaintiff. Then the warrants aren't going to be granted, um, either at the, at the uh, emergency basis or on a, on a final order. Um, In the next section, section three is emergency relief. And unless folks have other questions, I think it's, I think I've expressed my, my concerns. Um, uh, when you're on section four, the bottom of page uh, 10, I think I touched on that this morning, the idea of that's the new crime. shall report to the House and Senate committees on judiciary the number of show cause hearings held during the previous 12 months <coughs> as a result of compliance or non-compliance with a temporary or final order. Um, I mean, there was a question asked earlier this morning by one of the representatives about how uh, a violation of the order is handled or enforced or monitored, and I think it was... David Shear described that if 
if an order is outstanding and there is a violation of no contact or no texting and they text, it's up to the individual to report that to the police. Um, and then the police investigate it to the extent they need to. It's then reported and hand on to the state's attorney and they file the criminal charge that they referred to this morning. So I'm not sure where the show cause orders come into play. Eric? Yeah. Uh, Eric, it's Patrick with Council. I think there's an anticipation that there's going to be language proposed at a, at a later time that will connect up what that show cause order refers to. It, there was a, uh, a miscommunication about whether something's going to be included in the original version of the it's not there. So. That will become clear. Try to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was worried about that. The light will be provided. Thank you. Um, so then the next major section, I've touched on it some, uh, Section 8, the family member. Um, under the present system, um, it's through law enforcement and um, state's attorney to process those requests. The law enforcement presumably gets contacted by an individual or family member. They do whatever investigation they feel they need to do in order to respond <coughs> promptly. They relay that information to the state's attorney. The state's attorney in turn contacts the judge for the Yerpa order. And I can tell you that there have been approximately 20 orders uh, each year that the, the uh, Yerpa law has been in effect. Uh, this would add a dimension uh, under the current system where um, if a family member wanted an order, um, if I understand this correctly, they would not have to contact law enforcement and the state's attorney. Having said that, as I said before, we could not have them contact a judge directly for this order. Um, it would not work for any number of reasons that I'll be glad to explain. <coughs> so, so is this this pretty much the same issue of after hours versus during court hours. Is there any problem with during court hours and family member being the one that petitions no, the I court? No, I mean, okay. if, if they were to file a petition, Excuse me. then we would deal with it during court hours. Right. And okay. that may be the way to look at some of these issues that, as I said earlier, at the very beginning, I said we've got to look at what stage are we at, emergency or final. And maybe there's things we can do in a final order setting that you can't do on an emergency basis. Well, an emergency basis, it doesn't necessarily mean after hours, does it? I mean, it can be during regular hours, they, they come in. But if they came in during regular hours, they would have to file a petition. In other words... They would file just a, the same kind of petition. It's just that there can be an emergency situation where somebody, a family member, can go to the court without a problem from what you're telling us if it's during court hours. It's still right. considered an emergency order if it's ex parte and they come in and... It would be. It right. It would right. be considered an emergency. It just seems like some, that some of the testimony makes well, it sound like the, the emergency ones are the after hours ones and the finals are the during court hours ones, but there can be emergency ones that are during sure. court hours. I mean, well, well, we get my our, simple point I'm trying to make yeah. Right, but the difference would be is that in an after hours request there's no opportunity for the judge to <coughs> question the individual. Whereas uh, in, in court, court time hours, the individual can come in, not only file, but there's a possibility that they would actually, if the court felt necessary, to have a hearing and take testimony, create a record, much like what you're seeing in that Hemingway case. <coughs> but again, that's another way to look at some of these issues. Um, I don't think the answer is to now add this burden on to uh, court staff who would, who have never done this, uh, have played no part in it. We're talking after hours. Yes, yes. So I, I just don't, but the answer could be that if you want to skip law enforcement, then with this, um, have them contact the state's <coughs> attorney. Let the state's attorney deal with that issue so that the state's attorney becomes the conduit. Pepper had suggested that we could just do it like we do with RFA, so I figure I at least have got to throw it to the states. But, but in reality, again, it's the same issue that I see in the request for a, a civil warrant. I mean, you, you need an intermediary, but you need someone, I believe, 
who understands the process and what, what you need to marshal the evidence necessary uh, to get whatever order you're trying to get, whether it's a warrant or whether it's an herbal order. Um, again, these folks are always in a position of stress and I think they need someone who, from a professional perspective, can address that stress and get the information <coughs> that they need in order to get the, get the order they want. Coach? So, so uh, going back to uh, normal hours uh, uh, and the regular proceedings, one of the uh, questions that came up around <coughs> system. I mean, the, the orders obviously are in our system, and then for a case with a relief and abuse order, um, that's transmitted to the to the holding stations um, immediately. Well, the, uh, we we took testimony, and there was a question mark there. Uh, that's not what kind of happens. Are you talking about the federal? No, 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 no. Our own. Holding state, yeah. The, you know, Vermont's. <coughs> so, anticipating that question, I did write to, uh, I don't know if I have an answer yet. You know, the reason, you know, that, the, the, the thought being that it would seem to make sense that with our new um, uh, data system, that it might help facilitate <coughs> Well, it should be happening now, or putting aside the, the new case management system. These orders, as, as I understand it, once I've signed the order, you go to the clerk's office and you go to, to the holding stations. Uh, and then they're available. That's where the disconnect is. Isn't that what we, what we heard? Did you hear that in some other? Um, we heard, yes, we did hear that, I, I think. Um, Was it part of this bill? Excuse me? Was it part of this bill? Um, no, it was it was before when we were taking um, testimony on some of the challenges of domestic violence and right. yeah. um, be interested in and, um, knowing more about what whatever testimony you heard. Yeah, right. yeah. We'll I mean, it shouldn't be happening. I mean, we shouldn't have to wait for, <coughs> for the new case management system to be used. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Thanks. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um, and if you, if you want, I can wait till the very end because I'm kind of circling back to the end of your testimony. I'm kind of circling back to something you said earlier. So. Okay. Um, we have no comment on the use of the health care provider. And I think the last piece uh, is the conditions of release. Adding that as a statutory requirement, I. That is, that is so standard that I could just ask for a sample from the local court in Bay Area. This is 40 conditions of release is what they call their possible, their, their menu of standard conditions and I've highlighted 13. You may not buy, have, or use any firearms or dangerous weapons. And then there's a space to the narrative if there's some unique item that someone has used as a weapon that we can in other words, we can add to the standard language. So, um, 
adding that language to the statute isn't really going to add anything to what we do by adding it to the statute doesn't mean we have to do it. It's just another possible condition, but it's already so ingrained in the system that um, I don't think it, we're not opposed to it. I just don't think it will add to it. And you said that's Barry, from the Barry. Okay. Um, do all courthouses have that? They may not have this exact same form, mm -hmm. but they, they have uh, standard conditions of probation, I mean, uh, of release, and for instance, we're part of the criminal oversight committee that I also sit on mm -hmm. um, is in the process now of going through and coming up with a form that would get out to all the courts. But I've never sat in a court uh, that didn't have that condition in there. Would it be possible to get the forms from all the, the different courts? Sure. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Um, and I think I think that was the last piece. Thank you. So I just wanted to circle back around a little bit on the after hours. Because um, I've been sort of puzzling you know, over and just thinking, <coughs> linking it back to um, what we did after we got with the temporary affidavit. And um, I mean, I, I really hear what you're saying about the conceptual difference between court staff and police filling this role, but, but sort of putting that aside, because I think I would really want to hear from other witnesses about the pros and cons of transferring that whole process to police and what kind of, of silencing or amplifying effect that might have on people coming forward. Um, but just so within the process that we have, I heard you talk about you know that there's more contract workers doing more work telephonically and that maybe there's concerns with adding um, this requirement on but but I just kept sort of like thinking back to um, the problem and testimony that we heard a couple of years back and it in many ways it seems to me like having contractual workers doing those workflows telephonically actually answers some of the concerns, like that court staff who are already in nine to five roles are feeling burdened by the expectation that fell. And I think your testimony today kind of bear, maybe bears that out. And that there's safety concerns. And so I guess I wanted to understand a little more, um, like how are these contracts workers hired, how are they trained to do this work, just to understand a little more about the nature of the contract workers and if there might be some <coughs> system improvements there to where that could help. I, I don't get involved in the recruitment or training of them, so I couldn't. Tell. But is it the judiciary? Oh, yeah. I assume it's the judiciary oh, yes. doing that, right? Because they're sort of temporary court clerks. No, they're not as, no, the, the contract the, council don't have anything to do with the court, other than that they are hired specifically for after hours access. In other words, they're not, they're not court staff members, they're hired set for contract. Okay, but the contract is with the court. The judiciary hires to fill this function. Uh, and then is the judiciary training? They, they give training. I don't know what the okay. training is. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm not involved in the recruitment. I don't know exactly what the nature of the contract yeah. is. But they're not. They're not otherwise court employees. They are hired specifically for after hours availability. Mm -hmm. I think I'd be, if it's possible to bring information back about the recruitment and training. Sure, I'd be I mean, there'd be curious another, to hear more about probably that. Probably another witness. <coughs> would. It seems like in some ways it answers some questions and concerns potentially, but. Well, it's, it certainly has could. allowed us to bridge the, the, the gap of staff that no longer are going out. So right. in that sense, it's helped. But my concern is, as I was stating uh -huh. already ad nauseum, is uh, adding another legal process to what they're doing mm -hmm. um, strikes me as the wrong direction to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And the warrant, there are other ways that the warrant could be, could be processed uh -huh. without involving. Right. <coughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Um, Thank you, Judge.
about a 10 minute break and I'll continue our testimony. Great, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Members of the committee, Madam Chair, my name is Darren Goins. I'm the state director for the National Rifle Association. Uh, I'm here to testify in opposition to H610, um, but I will say that I'm going to focus on the default proceed provision. We have a lot. We have a lot of speakers, and I, you know, in the interest of not repeating testimony, I figured I would um, discuss that more in depth. Uh, Chris Bradley, who is on the list, and the Vermont Federation of Sportsmen's Club, they are the official NRA state association. So. Our positions are going to be the same, and I know he's going to focus on that part of the bill, as will others. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the domestic violence provisions, the red flag, extreme risk protection orders. But I wanted to, um, to talk about the, the default proceed um, portion of the bill, and we're opposed to that because the, it's already federal law that after three days, um, the dealer, if they get a hold, um, they, the dealer can proceed, but there's no obligation for them to proceed. They can still opt not to do that. And it, I did contact the National Shooting Sports um, Foundation. We work in conjunction with them, and they do a lot of data sets. And it's also important to realize that when we use data, um, we, get our, we don't commission independent studies. All of our data sets come from... CDC, ATF, FBI, U.S. Justice Department. We use government source data. And I asked him, um, their government affairs director, for some numbers that I thought um, would be interesting. And the, the data set that they had most recently available was in 2014. And my question was, how many, how many people get caught up in this, right? And so 91% of the checks clear immediately and that is while the dealer is either on the phone or he has it queued up in their computer system so 91 percent of the checks happen almost instantaneously and of the nine percent that are delayed 98 percent of those are cleared up in three days so now we're talking about a very very small percentage of are, are you talking 98 percent of the nine or not, yes. or the 91 goes to 98%. Yeah, 91% go through, no right. questions asked. Yep. Well, I shouldn't say no questions asked. It means they go. They, there's an answer given. Now, that answer could be no, like somebody could be rejected. But for 91% of the, the, trans, the transfer requests that are put into the NICS system, 91%, there is an answer. So 91%... Are, excuse me, 91% have an answer. 9% are delayed. Mm -hmm. So of that 9%, okay. so we're, we're dealing with the 9% where there's a delay, and that's what the bill is speaking to, are, are the people that are delayed. So there's a delay. And of those, you gotta work through those. So 98% of the people who are delayed are, clear, are, are given an answer in three days. So now you're talking about what's left. And that's really what this what this bill is talking about. It's it's two percent of the nine that are delayed. I know it's kind of complicated, yeah, but no, no. I, so you're talking about it, it, and to to synthesize all of that, to look at the people who maybe would go through the system. The 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 transaction went through. What happens? Well, they go to the ATF and they say you need to retrieve that firearm. That person was was cleared. He shouldn't have been. And that percentage for that year was 0.01 percent. So we're, we're we're talking a very small sliver. So what we're left with is is the problem that's created here when when someone this, this bill is pretty harsh compared to even what other states have done. I mean, some states the New York bill originally went to three days. They were trying to extend it from three days to ten days. <coughs> this bill prohibits the completion of the transfer as long as the proceed never comes back. But also, I think it would be interesting to hear from folks from the ATF or the FBI because they're clearing 98% of these in three days. So what's the justification for needing a longer time period? I mean, do you need three days, do you need four, do you need 10? And the whole point of this is when the 1993 Brady Act went through, part of the fact that are part of the reason that they opted for 
um, background checks was part of that deal was that it would be an insta check. It would, all these records would be uh, computerized and it would be basically instant. And in fact, that's how it works. I mean, most of this stuff go, goes through while the dealer is literally on the phone with them. So the people who are, are hung up, well, why are they hung up? They're hung up because of common names most of the time. Um, you know, there's always the, the famous cases of Senator Edward Kennedy who couldn't board a plane because he was, he was flagged on one of the fly lists because he has a common name. And you can look at names that aren't even that common. Um, I'm trying to look to see, if, I mean, yeah, everybody uses John Smith, but I'll, you know, if, even if you came up with like Sandra Robinson, something that's not incredibly common, but relatively common, type that into Facebook sometime. You're gonna get 20, 30 returns in the country, and those are just the people on Facebook. So you can imagine in criminal databases for all 50 states, the commonality of names and just because someone with the name Sandra Robinson <coughs> was flagged in Minnesota, all of a sudden my record comes up, well not my record, but another woman with that same name comes up as a delay. Now keep in mind, the problem that the courts look at this with is you're suspending somebody's constitutional rights. And that person may not be prohibited, it's just that they have a common name. So you get into some serious constitutional issues where you're suspending rights for folks. I mean, this would be, this would be like the equivalent of Fourth Amendment rights under search and seizure. I mean, how many times do they throw out murder convictions because they found something um, incidental to a search that uh, they throw out the evidence? And you know, that's heartbreaking that, that justice isn't served there. But think about these cases where there are people uh, with common names and and. Their, their constitutional rights are suspended. And this bill is problematic because now you're removing the remedy for that. And that's that at least if you had five, six days, I mean, they would eventually be cleared. This creates a system where they're just never cleared. And I'm not sure that the courts would look at this very favorably. And the problem is, I don't know, but I can't think of another state there. I mean, you, you guys might be able to come up with another state, but certainly me working on this in multiple states, I'm not aware of another state that does this. Now, even New York had 30 days. Now, and also I might comment on that, a NICS check is only good for 30 days. <clears throat> so that potentially created uh, an endless loop there where they wait the 30 days, the NICS check is invalid, you have to run it again. You, you, I mean, you get the idea. So this is even potentially worse than that because uh, from a constitutional uh, <coughs> viewpoint, it just says well, you can't proceed at all unless you get the, get the proceed. There, there's no remedy for a person who's denied. Um, and so I would suggest that someone is probably going to be caught up in this and then is going to file a lawsuit and it'll work its way through the court system, probably all the way to the US Supreme Court at some point. So this is a little bit of uncharted water on this. And the, and the other thing too, is I, you know, I, would, I would ask you like, what are you trying to accomplish? Because uh, you know, if, if your argument is three days isn't enough, well how long is enough? I mean obviously the federal government at some point determined with the computerized checks being online that, okay, they can clear most of these up in three days. And the, and the evidence that I've given you, the statistics I've given you, show that they, they are clearing 98% of the cases in three days. So this isn't me advocating for stretching, because our position is the federal law is three days, and that's sufficient, and we don't support anything beyond that. <coughs> but certainly, if your, argue, if your argument is that three days isn't enough, how much time is enough? But this bill would just put people in complete limbo and not offer them any sort of remedy. For, and again, the constitutional issue is here. Somebody could be delayed and not be a prohibited person. And that's a, just a complete violation of their constitutional rights. And that's where the litigation problem is, is probably eventually going to occur. Um, and with that, that's the part of, as I said before, you know, we object to some of the other issues um, on extreme risk protection orders, for example, extending it to family members, you know, versus 
now coming from a state's attorney, some of the due process issues on ex parte hearings. But again, other witnesses are going to, to speak to that. But I wanted to highlight uh, the portion of the bill that deals with the default proceed portion. So, and with that, that's my testimony. So with the, with the three days, um, I guess the base question is where did it come from? But where did it, was it determined that three days, I, I guess, was there an agreement between parties that we could, uh, that it could go to three days and still be considered uh, an instant check? Is that, is that the bottom line basis for three days or? Yeah. I mean, a little history, I guess. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I mean, I think if you put it in the context of, of historically where this falls in, I mean, 1993, you're, you're, you're talking, what, th almost 30 years ago? And so um, before that, there, was, there weren't many waiting periods, but a few states had them, and their argument was, at the time, that, um, and keep in mind, remember what, I mean, it's easy for us to forget now that we're in the age of, of iPads, iPod, i everything, but before that, the sheriffs, somebody would come in and apply for a firearms, they actually had to interview neighbors, employers, et cetera. I mean, that, that was the background check system. I mean, the records keeping wasn't nearly what it is today. So if someone got caught up in one of these with a, uh, with a delay, there needed to be police investigative work that needed to take place. Whereas in 93, this stuff was all coming online. So part of the, part of the deal that was negotiated at the federal level is, all right, you can do background checks on dealer transfers. That's, that was the original Brady Bill, the <coughs> background checks. But part of that was this compromise that this stuff is now an insta-check, it's computerized, so people shouldn't be delayed. And you know, now we're several years removed from that, and three days, I, keep in mind, this was three days was agreed on 30 years ago. And so as more and more of this stuff has been um, improved, and you, you look at everything that's happened, even after Virginia Tech, they, the Congress passed the Nixon Improvement Act because they found out that, that there were all sorts of <coughs> met, uh, mental health records that weren't being submitted to Nix. So now they require, first, the, the Nixon Improvement Act did, did a couple things. When, when it, was that? I'm sorry. Uh, it was after Virginia Tech. I think that was about 2007. I'm, oh, I'm going no, on. No, that's close enough. Thank you. Um, fix Nix was 2017. No, not Fix Nix. Um, th this would be the Nix Improvement Act, which was after um, Virginia Tech. And that, and that, that required um, states to um, submit their mental health records because they were looking at some, some actually quite big states that had submitted you know, one or two records over a long period of time. So it provided a, an incent, a carrot and a stick, basically. There, if you submitted your records, we were one of the first set of states, there was a time period on it where they gave you grants, the federal government gave you grants to do things like modernizing your computer systems, et cetera. And then if you weren't compliant after so long, then there were penalties. Like for example, if you weren't compliant, then some of the grant monies that you were getting through other programs had to be dedicated to certain public safety. It was like almost like what they were doing on everybody lowering their BAC levels to 0 .08. If you weren't compliant, then all your federal funding had to go into certain safety programs. Well, they did the same thing on these mental health records for NICS checks. And that, that, that is, I mean, we're 10 years removed from that. All, all the states now have to be fully compliant. But I give this as an example of we came up with three days almost 30 years ago before there, there's several pieces of legislation that it, have improved the background check system. Now, I'm not here advocating for you know, universal background checks by any stretch of the imagination, but what I am telling you is that we have consistently said that we would be much better served in this country if we looked at improving background checks instead of expanding them. Because look at all the people who go through the, I mean, some of these terrible episodes that we've seen, these people have passed background checks. Jared Loeffner in Arizona passed a background check. I mean, I, I could actually wear you out with the names of high profile shootings where pe these people have passed background checks. So our position has always been improve background checks, not expand them. I mean, we need to improve what we have so that when we run a check, we're confident that it's accurate. 
And also, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but every, every, every holiday, you get to Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's, a, it's, it's um, gun sales peak over the holidays. And the, the transfers that happen in this country have continued to spike. I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of transfers. Just <coughs> think about this for a second. Millions and millions of firearms transfers, and 91% of them happen while the guy is on the phone instantly. So when you're left with the people who are delayed, how can you now say we should drag this on for days and weeks and months and according to this bill, potentially forever without clearing someone? And the trade-off is, again, it would be one thing if you were keeping firearms away from bad guys, but what you're potentially doing is suspending someone's constitutional right just because they have a common name. And, and I mean, I, I would think that that's not going to withstand you know, constitutional muster. So I'm sorry, that was a very long that, answer. That's all right. Question. Say, Barbara? You had your hand up, didn't I you? I did, but okay. Selena can go first. Selena? I thought, I, I saw you right, first out of the corner of my you. eye, so. So, my understanding is it's not like Vermont wants it to just drag out, but it's important that it not just be a default that it's being given to somebody by an arbitrary date. And I get your point about somebody whose rights are being denied because it went on for a long time. But I'm also concerned about the people who ended up killing who were in that 1% that, you know, even one of them, you know, because we're so concerned about meeting a date. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is it's the feds, right? It's not Vermont who's going to be holding it up. Um, we just need a definitive <coughs> answer right. if the person's clear. Do you mind if I respond? Yeah, no, I was yeah. hoping you'd... Yeah. No, Representative, I, I completely... Are, listen, you and I walk in the same grocery stores, down the same streets. I mean, I, nobody wants a bad guy to have a fire. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Um, so I think what I'm trying to narrow down here is that most of them get cleared. So let, I think the question should start to focus on what causes somebody to be delayed, right? Because just because they're delayed and it defaults to, to proceed, that, that means that they've searched the databases and these people aren't being flagged in the debate. Because if they were flagged, they wouldn't be able to have the firearm, right? So there's not, there's not evidence that, the, that a bad guy is being given a gun because they've run the check. They've run it through state records. And I think Chris's testimony will focus on what exactly a NICS check is. And, and it, it's, it's, it's quite thorough. And so their name has been, so, what, so I guess what I'm trying to do is give you some reassurance that, that if someone is, has been um, given a proceed and their name has been run through there, it's not like a default proceed sort of like, well, we don't really know if this guy is dangerous or not. No, their, their name has been run through the, an exhaustive database and it's come back, you know, I, that's why I think probably the committee would be well served to look at um, asking questions, what causes someone to be delayed? My answer is commonality of name accounts for most of it. And, the, and, the, and, I, and again, this is supposition on my part, but I would be willing to venture that that is why 98% of the 9% who are delayed are cleared within three days. So. And what are you basing? I mean, in some ways, it's like if the state or the, I'm sorry, the gun dealer isn't getting the name back, it could be, wow, that person was on a, you know, a list that they couldn't get it, but we want to double check if they're still on that list. I mean, it seems like it could be a gazillion things. And for us to assume it's just a double name. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm actually saying the opposite okay, of what right. you just said, and that is if it comes back that they're on one of these lists, they're prohibited. Right. So, so, so then it, it wouldn't be but default proceed, it would be right. rejected, right? Right, but if the name doesn't come back. Yes, and I know that the dealers, um, it said when you fill out the federal form, uh, it, it said your social security number is not required, but they advise you to give it. To clear up some of these some of these name issues. Now, the the name issue is only one of the issues I'm raising. I'm sure that, that the folks that deal with this probably at the FBI and some of the you know the actual database administrators would be able to tell you 
other reasons why um, it would come back delayed. First of all, there aren't many that come back delayed. 98% of the ones that are delayed um, are cleared up. So you're, you're talking about a small sliver. And again, the small slit, I can't emphasize this enough, the small sliver who are still delayed have been run through the database and there's been nothing in there that's rejected them. But maybe it's a case of we're not sure that their identity, we, there's no, there's nothing to substantiate that there is a Fred Jones anywhere. So we're suspicious about the, I mean, it, I think we're all speculating. Yeah. And you're right, we should find out. But I wouldn't want to err on the side of making the wrong decision. Like, I, that, I think that's a worse lawsuit to have. And just living with ourselves that we, in our haste to make sure somebody got their gun right away, we make a big mistake. Um, Selena, Matt, then Mark. So we did hear testimony last week from our legislative council and I believe some others that one reason sometimes for the delay is just the variability in state law and how an interpretation that needs to happen to line up to the federal prohibition, particularly with regards to um, domestic violence. Just because the, the, um, the laws are very different state to state. And so I <coughs> wonder if you want to respond to that and also just if your research has turned up any other reason than just common name you know, name duplication for some of those delays? Yeah, I can speak a little bit on the domestic violence um, issue because, I mean, I've also handled New York. And some of the states, for example, their definition of what sort of a misdemeanor offense under domestic violence is a prohibiting offense varies from state to state. But that is taken into account in the NICS system in terms of they put the state law in there. So like, for example, in South Dakota or Wyoming, this particular, I don't even want to call it, I'm going to call it misdemeanor because that's what it is, you know, whether it's domestic <coughs> violence or it's like a stalking charge or whatever it is because each state deals with it differently. But I guess what I'm trying to, to articulate is that if, the, if, if New York, for example, <coughs> has misdemeanor offenses, a bigger list of prohibited offenses, Nick's flags it. it that, that transfer will not proceed because New York has misdemeanor offenses that are disqualifiers. Whereas in another state that doesn't have that misdemeanor disqualifier, it, it would go forward. So that it does take into account the state laws. So you don't think it's accurate that that accounts for some of those? For the delays? delays is, is, is trying to clear on the interpretation of whether there's a prohibition? You know, I, I, that, would, that would cause me to speculate, and I don't want to want to <laughs> speculate on that, but it seems reasonable that they would want to look at if the state, um, if, a, if a, a particular, and you would be talking exclusively about misdemeanors, if that state's misdemeanor offense was a disqualifier in that state, could that account for a delay? Sure. Is that does that account for a significant number of the delays? Um, that would that I, I can't imagine that being the case. That it would be a significant number, and not only that, but after you've resolved that issue once, it should be taken care of because they would say, okay, this New York um, one came through and and the person was delayed. Do we think that that offense is a disqualifier? You know, once they made that determination, then every other one that was entered into the queue with that same offense, that question would be resolved. So I can't imagine it would create additional delays. I guess it, I'm just struggling a little bit. Like I, I feel like um, <coughs> a couple conclusions we could reach from the statistics you shared, and and one, I think your your argument is is a very small amount of the cases that are being delayed and that, um, that some of, a large percentage of those delays are technical, like tech, just technical in nature. And 
I guess I'm wondering the reverse of that. Like, if it's a really small amount of cases that are being delayed, um, and there are instances where, for example, you know, parsing out like how a domestic violence charge from one state relates to the prohibition, um, I guess I'm trying to understand the other side of that. Like, what's the harm? Yeah, and I would say, I guess, I mean, this is the danger. I guess I tried to layer it, right? And so, first of all, I want to say that it was extremely rare. But the, again, the thing that I wanted to emphasize is all the people, 100% of them, have been run through the databases, and there was nothing, presumably, that would have caused it to be rejected. So it wouldn't be like someone who hadn't gone through a background check at all. I mean, the person was run through the system and there was nothing that was flagged. Um, and again, I think that probably the committee would be well served to look at some of the reasons for delays and maybe get the numbers. I mean, I don't have the answers to those questions. I mean, um, you know, whether it's ATF or FBI, you know, my testimony is that it's, it's very rare. I mean, almost all of these go through, the ones that don't go through, they're resolved within three days. So your question to me was, what's the harm in waiting? But the problem with this bill is, it's not just waiting. We're saying <coughs> it doesn't go through at all. Well, it's not even about waiting. I think as I read the bill, it, just, it would go through once a unique, once it actually passed the, right? A unique identification number. Yeah, with, but without a time frame. So presumably the onus is on no one to ever clear this. Uh -huh. And again, I mean, think about this in terms of other constitutional rights. If you just said, well, we can't resolve it. I mean, I, I, listen, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I think that if this were adopted and someone gets caught up in this situation, they're going to sue. It's going to go through the court process. It's going to get litigated. And I think that they have an, I'm not even an attorney, but I think they have an airtight case that their constitutional rights by this law are just unequivocally being abridged because you're just saying that there's, uh, you're not saying, the, the, the legislation is saying that there's no time frame for even resolving it. There's no resolution on it. And I, I just don't think that that withstands any sort of <coughs> constitutional muster. I mean, I don't even think it's a close call. Um, that's why part of me is like, you guys passed the bill. I mean, this is going to be an easy one to overturn. But again, my opinion. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're the right person. So if you're not, just say so. I'll be happy to confess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have questions having read a bunch of um, documents that we've been given about uh, what happens after the fact if a um, default proceed goes forward and then uh, a <coughs> firearm is sold and the process when ATF gets involved to take that back. Are you, would you be able to speak to that a little bit? I'm sure. Uh, not very in depth. I just do know, as I said in my testimony, that 0.01% of these were turned over to the ATF for, then, for, then, for them to then retrieve the firearm. It, it, mostly my questions involve, and I guess this is for future anyone who's testifying, but around the number of times that once that is turned <coughs> over to ATF that they are successful in retrieving that firearm. Yeah, that I, I, I would not be able to comment okay. on. Yeah. Thank you. Byron? Uh, I have a few questions. Um, so first of all, have there been uh, any other amendments to the NICS system or improvements to the NICS system? heard Chris kind of in the background suggest something in 2017, but if there have been, what were they and when were they? Yeah, um, well, the, again, the, the, the um, fixed NICS is, is something different, but the, um, the NICS Improvement Act after Virginia Tech is, is one. Um, you know, you could go back to the Lautenberg Amendments, the stuff that was added um, for domestic violence. 
I mean, there have been <coughs> constant tweaks to the to the NICS system. What is the fix NICS? Uh, fix NICS? Yeah. I, you know what? I'll let that was an N NSSF program, and I'll let Chris probably talk about that a little bit more. NSSF? Yeah, National Shooting Sports Foundation. Yeah. I that, thought he was only talking about the other things. Just kidding, Chris. You <laughs> I'll, I'll address that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, okay, well, um, all right, different question then. Um, have there been any cases challenging uh, Utah's law, which, as I read it, uh, seems to be open ended like ours? I don't know when it was put into place, but in that law, they have to have a background check, uh, and it says a dealer may not sell or transfer a firearm to an individual until the dealer has provided <coughs> the bureau, I'm not sure who the bureau is, with, uh, with the information in sec subsection four. That's the background mm -hmm. check. Uh, and has received approval from the, from the Bureau under the subsection 7, which explains how that is approved. So it appears to me, maybe I'm reading it wrong, because I just read it right now, uh, haven't studied it, but it appears that that is open-ended. Uh, Florida law also appears open-ended. Do you know of any cases that have challenged? No, yeah, I don't. And again, we're talking about recency on this issue. This issue. I mean, this okay. pretty much obviously came up after after Charleston, right? So, um, <clears throat> yeah, this this was effective. I just read, it was effective last year. So yeah, yeah. Fair so enough. five and, five four nineteen. Yeah, and like for example, New York. I, I mean, I can't. Some of these states I can't comment um, as intelligently on either because they're not states under my purview. Which is, you know, I do Vermont, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey. And so in the case of New you York, have the best states, so. what's that? You have the best I, I, states. Well, so. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, but in the case of New York, um, they did the bill uh, just last year. I mean, it, it hasn't even been in for a year. Um, so on some of these states, you know, it takes a while, first of all, for somebody to be caught into the sloop, right. for it to run through the court system. So I'm not aware, I'm not aware <coughs> of any challenges at this point. Um, okay, so uh, but it's a recency issue. More yeah, than no, anything. I see that. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah. what when this was passed, and, I, and I'm sure Florida is uh, very uh, recent as well. Uh, one other question is, <coughs> as far as it, if an individual is caught up in this, like you say, that that there's not any forthcoming uh, determination, either yay or nay, they're caught in. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how you put it, but. Uh, uh, is there an opportunity through another process, for instance, uh, providing the information to seek uh, a unique personal identification number, the UPIN? Is that a process that would allow such an individual to get around the fact that he's in limbo, I guess is the way you put it, uh, to be able to obtain his firearm or her firearm? Yeah, I'm not sure what process ultimately becomes available to someone who is just exhausted, I, I mean, who's I, I guess it, you have to, to initiate court proceedings to, you know, to eventually get it resolved. Well, and not necessarily if there's this other process <coughs> that allows an individual to... I, there, are, there are situations, as I understand it, that individual, they have the name and date and all the other stuff, and every time they purchase a firearm, they're denied, and then they have to go through a bunch of rigor roll, to, rigor roll, you know, yeah, whatever, uh, to get their uh, uh, firearm. But this, there seems to be these processes to deal with that situation. Yeah, it's an extra step, you know, to to either appeal or to get this right. U pin number. <clears throat> but it's my understanding that with that, you kind of pre-approved essentially. Is that not the yeah, case? Yeah, yeah. I would imagine that? probably the equivalent would be like on your TSA checks, you know, pretty right. clear or whatever. Um, now, I, but the problem is this would probably be the, and again, I'm not as well versed in what TSA does, but this would probably be like if, if you know, pre-clear, I mean, do they ever come up with delays? I don't know. Right. Um, so what if, what if the people are attempting to get you pinned and then that's delayed? That's why I think that before you proceed <coughs> with the, um, with the legislation, it would probably be beneficial to understand why people are being delayed. And, and so, because this, I just feel like says, all right, if you come back delayed, you're just, you're delayed until, until it's approved. And 
there's no time frame on approving it. And that's where I'm saying the constitutional issue arises, right? Is that there's ultimately no, there's no remedy in it. And that's why, you know, the New York bill just passed last year, and that's potentially gonna be a problem because they put 30 days on it, which is just as bad because the next check is good for 30 days, it expires and it creates this endless loop. Um, and you know, and our position has been that three days was something that they agreed upon 30 years ago. The system has been improved. I don't know what kind of argument it would take for, for the federal folks to take longer than three days to investigate these. I mean, what's, I mean, and, that, and again, these are questions for them, right? Um, because if you're saying five days, 10 days, and I'm not, again, I'm not advocating for any of that because the federal law is three days. And I, you know, and, the, and this goes back to the basic premise of what we were talking about and, you know, the two questions I had from the representatives about erring on the side of caution and, and just not passing the checks. But keep in mind, there are probably more people that have gone out and done bad things who have passed a background check, who've actually been cleared than the people who have been delayed. <coughs> I mean, I don't see any evidence that there are a whole bunch of people that have been delayed um, that have gone out and done bad things. But there is a long list of people who have passed background checks and gone out and done bad things. And that goes to my argument that we should be focus our energy on improving these systems, improving what background checks we do have, rather than expanding them. I have a question. Uh, just on what you just described, um, improving background checks as opposed to expanding them, what are some of the things that can be done to improve background checks? Well, we've, we've done a lot of that in terms of mental health reporting on um, the states that have <coughs> domestic violence. There's a lot of stuff that goes into to background checks. But I think that we get so wrapped up on background checks, background checks. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. In New Jersey, I mean, I have to have an FID card. I've got to have a purchase permit. Um, I buy a rifle, a shotgun, and a pistol. I buy three guns. I pass five background checks in a month on the same person in a month. What's changed? We're doing multiple background <coughs> checks on the same people over and over again instead of actually looking at improving some of these things. And again, that goes to your question, um, military records. I mean, we saw uh, you know, one of the military bases where there was a shooting. The guy had been flagged in the service, dishonorably discharged. That's a prohibited offense. Was never transmitted that record from, from the branches of the service into the NICS database. Those are the types of things that we should be focused on, right? Because we, I mean, our position is we don't want bad guys with guns. And when you're all of a sudden changing the focus on, you know, in terms, and this gets off on a different issue, but universal background checks, you know, me transferring a gun to my cousin or somebody that I know and who isn't a criminal, when all of a sudden we're focused on that, we forget about the bad actors who have maybe been, you know, discharged from the military and the service. We got to start. If you go to the doctor for a cold and you got lung cancer and he's prescribing cough drops, you're going to die of cancer, right? And I feel like on this gun stuff, we're doing the same thing. We're focusing on the good guys. And I'm going to tell you, I, I mean, I did this. I bought, I, I bought a couple firearms, and and to do the paperwork with the local police and to buy the guns, I ended up doing something like four or five background checks in six weeks. <laughs> on me. It's a waste of it's a waste of resources, right? They're investigating me over and over again, and and yet there's something as simple as somebody being discharged dishonorably from the military, and that record doesn't make it into the NICS database. I mean, we're focusing on the wrong stuff, and that's sort of what I'm getting at: is improve the improve the checks that we do have, and and you know look, look at expand you know. I don't think that the checks need to be expanded, they need to be improved. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Eddie? My name is Ed Cutler. I'm here representing the Gun Owners of Vermont. Uh, membership is somewhere pretty close to 7,000 people right now. 
7,000 paid members. <laughs> yep. Don't listen to Richard, he doesn't know what he's talking about. If you know what I'm talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you all have charts that I left you. Um, this is the FBI uniform plan. And there's a couple of questions I'd like to answer that were asked last week to begin with. Um, the first question was um, about false IDs, you know, the computer stuff you were talking about. That's not how criminals buy guns. The way they do it is they steal them, they buy them from people who steal them, or they get them from straw purchasers. <coughs> now, straw purchasers literally, hey buddy, could you go get that for me? Because you can pass the check and I can't. All three of those are serious federal felonies. Ten years in prison for either one of them, uh, especially the uh, falsification on the ATF form. You have to certify and swear that uh, you are not buying this firearm for somebody else. So that's ten years in prison for lying, which is a pretty serious thing, <clears throat> but it is not a deterrent. Okay, Eric is going to. Uh, pretty much cover the federal background checks and how they go and how they work. Um, the bill stops people from obtaining firearms indefinitely and takes their right to self-defense away. In other words, um, as just testified, if you don't make that three-day thing and the ATF doesn't, or the FBI doesn't return, uh, a go after those three days, you could be left defenseless. Now, in Vermont, the crime rate is extremely low. The murder rate is almost non-existent. Um, but we have wild animals. Um, we had a bunch of years ago a big rabies epidemic. I think all of us could remember it. And uh, let's say you're being visited by that or now with the new uh, recycling laws, um, we have to compost all our food. Um, bears in the spring are really hungry. Bears with cubs are very protective. You go out to that compost pile with a bear problem and uh, you don't have a firearm, you need to get one just to defend yourself. If you can't do those three days, you can't defend yourself against that bear. And bears are a serious problem in this state. And they're about to get bigger, along with raccoons, skunks, or any type of rabbit animal, because rabies does come back. It's a cyclic thing. Um, other questions were raised, and this is what the FBI crime report is for, was how many uh, murders are, act actually they said homicides, but let's keep it to murders, which is different than homicides. And the FBI crime report has the charts, they have the numbers. Um, in 2018, which is the latest data, there were 10 murders. Out of those 10 murders, three of them were firearms. Not 50% like was testified last week, three. That's a lot less than 50%. Um, at the same time, um, there were Five with other weapons, which is knives, billy clubs, you name it. And there were two by hands, feet, and fists. So What was the time, time frame for that again, Eddie? Excuse Sorry. me? What was the time frame for that? That what, was what, the, what 2018. Frame? That's 2018, all right. Thanks. Yeah. And actually, that if, if you check back with the FBI crime report, year <coughs> after year after year, it's about the same in Vermont. Um, we've been very consistent except for 2010. In 2010, I can be proud to say there were zero firearms murders. Okay? Now, I want to compare this with uh, New England states, New York, and New Jersey. We we're going to use California, but we couldn't add up the numbers. Um, New Hampshire. 10, 21 murders, 12 by firearms. So their rate is actually higher than ours. And they're considered, this year, the safest state in the union. Maine, 
23 murders, 11 by firearms. Massachusetts, with all its gun control, 136 murders, 93 of them by firearms. Now this 93 number is pretty significant considering by their numbers, only 14% of the population have legally owned firearms. Unlike Vermont, who's probably somewhere up around 70%. Um, New York, 546 murders, 313 by firearms. Um, Connecticut, 83 murders. 54 by firearms. Now that's pretty close to uh, a little over that 50%. And most of the uh, southern New England states, New York and New Jersey, are well over the murder rate as far as firearms. We are sitting here in probably the highest firearms ownership state in the country and probably one of the highest in the world. I think only Switzerland beats us <coughs> as far as the ownership of firearms. At the same time, we have the lowest murder rate. Not only is it the lowest murder rate, but it's also the safest. If you compare, and I can't go any further than the FBI report, but if you compare Vermont with the rest of the world, Vermont has the lowest per capita firearms murder rate in the country. What we're doing in this committee now is we're looking to fix a problem that does not exist. The biggest thing and the biggest deterrent to violent crime, and a lot of people in this committee I can think of who will not agree with me, is the possession of firearms. Putting the cart before the horse, take away your guns. Putting the horse before your cart, is a chilling effect. And what I mean by a chilling effect, these numbers, the gun control states have higher firearms murder rates than the people who are pretty much safe and unlimited as far as what they can own. Um, here's the fun part. Brady does give us a good number of the amount of firearms going. Um, <clears throat> you'll hear from some people that the background checks don't count because they might not get firearms. The passes of Bra through Brady since 1996, which is when it took effect, is over <coughs> 600,000 firearms just in Vermont. If you figure it before Brady, because guns don't wear out, there are millions of guns in this state with a population of 625,000. Again, the mere mention of a firearm is not conclusive to being violent. It's just the opposite. Um, I have friends in the office or sheriff's department. Um, I never sat and talked to you about it, but I know sheriffs, fish and wildlife, they visit people with problems that if firearms are in the home, it's probably happened to you, but nothing is happening. Three murders a year, if we go by the, mem the Attorney General's testimony and the lady from the Moms Demand Action, if 50% of those murders are domestic, that's one and a half person a year over a population of 625,000. If this <coughs> bill passes, and we're going to go to taking away the guns from people, you're going to leave a person defenseless because when that TRO is given and that person walks in to that courtroom, the one, the, I guess, litigant, I'm not sure of the legal term, they're going to say, yep, he's got firearms, go take him away. Admittedly, the worst part of the time is the first two, three days. The police come, they take all those firearms. Now you've got two people over in, arguing over a vacuum cleaner in a divorce. Those are my guns, don't take those. No, those are my guns, get, get them out of here. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? You leave the person who's left at the house defenseless. 
in a time when they should be able to defend themselves. For this minuscule amount of times that these murders happen with these firearms, according to this chart, you're better off taking their knives and billy clubs away. Maybe every stick and tree. Because that would solve the problem even better. Um, the part on the medical part, I'm, I'm just bouncing around here. But on the medical part. What do you mean by the medical part? Um, the uh, persons endangered themselves or others. The, the hippo? That'd be, I think, the last page on, on the last section of this. Um, you're adding family members. Um, I have a twin brother and we constantly argue. We don't fight, we don't beat each other up, but we argue. Lots of people argue, it's part of life. You know, 10 minutes later, we're all nice, happy, and brothers again. But I can imagine, and I know people <coughs> this has happened to, where they can go and they can say, this person might be a danger because he got mad. This can happen. And then you take their constitutional rights away for owning a firearm. Um, Judge Grierson did an excellent job explaining that they already have the authority to take people's firearms away that deserve them. To make it something that would be mandatory or easier to do, well, I've been in a divorce, many of us have been in divorce, talk to anybody. It can get a little hectic, um, for lack of a better word, because people argue over vacuum cleaners. <clears throat> During my divorce, and here's a good example of it, my ex-wife's lawyer told my lawyer that if I did not agree to certain things and what she wanted was basically the serial numbers and the models of firearms I own. I don't even know every gun I own, as far as that stuff. That they were gonna pull a restraining order on me. <clears throat> Things like this happen. I can name dozens of people that I've talked to that things like this have happened. The lawyers routinely work for their clients and I, I don't hold it against them. I really don't. I have lousy lawyers, she had a good one. But um, it's easy to get a restraining order and when I got mine, and it was just a TRO, um, Basically, she didn't say I was violent because we were married for 20 years and we never raised our voices to each other. We grew apart. Um, she basically wanted the house, excuse me, wanted money for the house. Um, and there were certain things in the house that she wanted to make disappear. This is an old story. Many people have done it. The TRO thanks to the judge down in Brattleboro, and I don't remember his name, um, did not include firearms on that. Because in that TRO, she said, we'd never fought, I never, we never argued, anything like that. It was up to that judge to determine what was right and what was wrong. And I have a serious love of the court system in the state, because it's, it's one of the fairest systems I've ever seen. Things like that. So to make it so that the judge has to do something like that is ludicrous because there are situations, and a lot of them, like mine. Okay? Um, also in this thing, um, there are other pages with other things, violent crime, a whole bunch of stuff. But remember, <coughs> not in general, does not have a serious problem. It has a very minor firearm problem, realistically. Murder can be dealt with. The judges can make their decisions based on what they know and what they hear. Leave it to <clears throat> them to stand up for the rights of me and you, okay? 
Um, any questions? Any questions, anybody? It doesn't look like it. Thank you. Um, well, that's all we have for today. Um, anybody else that was on the list will be coming back another day. Yeah. Do you know what, or does Maxine have to do with it? What's that? Do you, do, do you know what day, or does Maxine have No, we, we, don't, we don't know right now. So, yeah. probably, we will. probably next week. Sure. Probably next week. Actually, uh, okay. week. Yeah. Just don't pick a snow day, because i got 130 miles to drive. Uh, he doesn't like snow days either. <laughs> what day is the snow next week? <laughs>